Hi, everyone. My name is Vandar Kogan. I am going to give a lecture today on Chapter 11, Solving Problems. I am doing this one for a project. And before I start, I just want to let you guys know I will not be able to cover the entire chapter because it's quite big chapter. But I will be covering the first part of the chapter here that is um, representing a problem types of problems. We have two kinds of problems that is well-defined problems and ill-defined problems. Under there, there is a cognitive skills in well and ill-defined problem solving and framing a problem, the roles of values. So if you, if you look at the chapters outline, there are quite a few topics that this, this chapter covers, but I will not be able to talk about the entire chapter. So if you if you look at the textbook, as uh, Professor Moore would say, please, please, please try to read the entire chapter in order to do well in your test because um, there is so much information. It's very hard to put everything in condensed form with this presentation. So I would highly recommend every one of you to please read the chapter before the test and uh, even for us as a psychology majors or you know whatever you're studying for this cognitive psychology it will really help to understand why we are studying and um, there is so much information and the beginning of this chapter there is a quote from Albert Einstein it says it's not that I am so smart it's just that I stay with the problems longer and um it's a very interesting, I really like that quote because sometimes we have, we all have faced problems in our life and um, and we are continuing to going to face problems as we get older and, you know, grow out of college life and things like that. And um, when we think about cognitive psychology in uh, previous chapters that everything is talked about, a cognitive psychology is like more about problem solving, reasoning, and decision making. This section by examining in depth the central topic of the problem solving, reasoning, and decision making, because these cognitive abilities have rules and properties of their own that are important to an understanding of human cognition. And um, before we go any further, we need to say what is the definition of a problem. According to our textbook in our cognitive psychology, a problem exists when the goal state and the current state are different. And what do I mean by that? And I want to give you an example about a high school student who just graduated from high school. And um, he is planning to go to college, but he hasn't decided which college he would like to go and what major is he would like to take and how many years he's going to study. But, you know, the current state for this high school graduate student is he just got graduated. His goal state is going to be graduating from college. And between those two, there are four years gap that he has to figure it out how he's going to get to that goal state. You know, uh, he has to choose the college, he has to choose the major, he has to go and meet with the advisors and he had to attend the classes and he needs to know how many credits to take and he has to do well before he can complete a college graduation. So the problem solving occurs when the current state is transformed into the goal state, you have achieved your goal. So for a graduate student, high school graduate student, in order to complete his college and to be graduated, then he completes his entire goal. And um, as we move on, how do we represent? This is the representing a problem the key to understanding human problem solving is how we represent the problem because um, what is problem for me may not be a problem for you or someone else you know for a child tying a shoelace 
will be very difficult. But after a week of teaching and learning how to tie a shoelace, it, it, that doesn't become a problem anymore. And it's same thing for us when we go to work in the beginning, you know, we have a week, a month to get used to our job. Once we learn all the logistics and how to do things in and around at our workplace, and we are very comfortable with it. And um, there is an example that is given in our textbook. It says a woman was given four gold chains for her birthday. Each chain was three links long. She wanted to join the four chains into a single close chain to make a necklace. However, having a link open would cost $2 and having a link closed would cost $3. The woman had her chains joined into a closed necklace for $15. How did she do this? You know, that is the problem that is represented to us and we need to figure it out. And they've already given all the explanation how much it's going to uh, cost for opening and closing and how much this woman spent. So every one of us look at this problem. We might have to work and think and reason and come to a conclusion. There is one other uh, example that was given. It's about, we are, we are talking about representing a problem. How do you represent to someone the problem? And there was this monk who, tra who tra tra traveled every day up on the top of the mountain to meditate. He took the same path. There is only one path to reach there. And every evening he would take the same path to come back. And uh, the textbook talks about that. And uh, at the end of the day, just as he settles in for a well-deserved rest, his mind wanders to whether every event is unique or whether, for example, there was a place on the path that he passed at the same time on both days. With this, he fell asleep. So the question arises, you know, like the problems that we are represented and how we are represented the problem, it helps us to solve it. And um, our understanding of the situation allows us to make use of personal knowledge or invent novel solution methods. However, as in the case of a gold chain, when we miss interpret the conditions, we may fail to appreciate the simple elements of the problem and not retrieve a successful solution method. And um, there is two kinds of problem solving. One is a routine problem solving. The other one is a non-routine problem solving. And let me explain what is routine problem solving. When we apply a learned knowledge or a technique to solve a problem, it is called routine problem solving. Non-routine problem solving stresses the use of the procedures or strat strategies that do not guarantee a solution to a problem, but offer the possibility of success. I think every one of us have learned a routine problem solving, which is a very basic thing, like from point A to point B, you know how to get to your university or which is the shortest path to take. And, you know, these are the things that we have learned over time and it becomes very routine for us, but there are some very complicated mathematical or, you know, some huge problem that is represented to us that needs little more of our thinking that is involved or, you know, even though with our thinking and reasoning, we may not always find the solution. Those are those are very rare. And sometimes we find that when in our workplaces, when we are given some task and we need to think little more than just making a day-to-day -day decisions. And um, there are two kinds of problems. One is a well-defined problem. The other one is ill-defined problems well-defined problems which possess distinctive properties. They have clear described goals. They specify all relevant information and a clear ending is obvious. Anytime when we say a well-defined problem, it's kind of everything is put together and it's right in front of us. For example, as I said, if we have to get to the university every morning at eight o'clock, you know what time to get up and you know 
what time you have to leave the house and you know which is the shortest way to take. If you, if you live in a place where I live, it takes exactly 10 minutes from my home to university. If I take this route, you know, and the end goal is I have to reach university five minutes before eight because the class starts eight, eight. So this is a well-defined problem. I know what needs to be done. I know what is the solution and I know what's the end goal is. And these are the, some of the characteristics for a well-defined problem. It's a clearly specified goals. That is for me to point A to point B, I have to reach in certain time. It is the characteristic of this type of a problem to have an unambiguous goals. All relevant informations are given because for me, another characteristics of a well-defined problems is that the information necessary for the solution is given in the problem statement. The problem is you need to get to the university five minutes before eight. How do you do it? And uh, third is a clear ending. The final characteristics of well-defined problem is that there is a stop rule because you have to reach five minutes before university, then your, your goal is complete. And um, that is a clear ending. That's where everything comes to stop. You have achieved your goal and you have completed your problem solving. Like for example, if I want to make a jigsaw puzzle, I first need to know how many pieces of jigsaw puzzle I'm going to make. And you know, this is a thousand piece, 500 pieces or 2000 two pieces or what, what part is the shortest? You know, some of us, we ask those kind of a questions in our life, you know, especially on uh, some, for some reason, I always find it, Broadway is very busy after October until New Year's, you know. I don't know where all the people come from and I have to always uh, take a different route around those three months, you know. And uh, who committed the crime in 19, 1990s, if you guys are much, much younger than me, uh, uh, there was a show, a lot of them are had to do with the detective shows, you know, who murdered what, and, you know, always a problem solving and things like that. These are some of the well-defined problems that is the characteristics of the problem solving. The second one is an ill-defined problem, which is a more challenging and more interesting then well-defined problems because you have to now look for answers. You need to look for solutions. You need to really think what the solution is going to be. And uh, in our textbook, there is this um, nine dot problem is given and your task is to draw a line through each of the dots by drawing no more than four straight lines without end tracing a line or lifting the pencil from the paper. This is one of the example for the ill-defined problem because it really doesn't give you a very clear cut. They don't say what shape it should be. All they say is you have to draw four line through each of the dots. And um, it's little confusing. Everyone can come up with their own different ideas and to reach the goal. So some of the characteristics of ill-defined, it is not always clear what the question really is or how to arrive at the solution or what a solution would look like. Because um, when I was looking at this problem in our textbook, I really didn't know how to come to that solution that they've given. I have to cheat it because I have to go back and look for the answer. How did they do it? And, you know, and it was very interesting. Sometimes we don't think out of the box to solve the problem. And especially I, I don't think out of the box. I'm a very traditional person. I try, try to stay within that line. And I thought there is no way I'm going to draw four line and touching all, all the dots in that um, problem. And um, they are open domain topics because you are free to consider any kind of information you want. Some examples of ill-defined problems include what career should I pursue? You know, we all have that urging questions like, you know, what are we doing? You know, if you ask a five-year-old child, a child want to be a police officer or a doctor or a lawyer, 
But as if you ask the same child after 10 years and the child's career will be very different. And by the time they get to a high school and college, even after, after graduation, we are, we are asking that same question, what do I want to pursue, you know? So these are the, some of the um, examples of the ill-defined problem or, you know, how can I be happy? Like happiness is not one for all, all for one, you know, it doesn't fit everybody the same way. What is happiness for me may be uh, different for you. What is happiness for you may be very different for me. These are the things that we have to figure out in our life, what makes me happy, you know, and we cannot just put it in a small box and gift wrap it and say, this is happiness for the entire world. It doesn't work. So that is another example of, um, ill-defined problem and this this question I really like is this person the love of my life oh my gosh how many of us ask that questions in our life you know even when you were 12 or 15 or 18 or 25 or even 40 sometimes we ask that same question you know is this the person the love of my life you know it's because it's it's, it's just changes we change as a human beings you know and I was, I'm not the same person that I was five years ago. My, my interest changes, not entirely that I changed, but you know, there are some things that I wouldn't do what I did five years ago. So these are very complicated problems that we have to deal with and we have to solve and we have to come up with our own solutions. And the other one is, is honesty the right action if it hurts someone's feelings? That is that is a philosophical question and many philosophers asked the same question and we are still asking that same question. Is honesty the right action if it hurts someone's feelings, you know? And these are some of the examples of the ill-defined problems in, um, there are some characteristics that um, ill-defined problem has is a neurological of moral reasoning and, um, it is until I read this chapter, I did not know that, you know, how the moral reasoning affects our brain and how a personal reasoning and impersonal reasoning affect two different parts of the brain. And I, it was, it was very interesting for me to read and um, study because um, there, there is an example in our textbook and, um, it says a trolley is running out of control down a track. In its path are five people who have been tied to the track by a mad philosopher who can flip a switch which will lead the trolley down a different track and avoid the five people. Unfortunately, there is a single person tied to that track. If you flip the switch, the person will be killed should you flip the switch. And there is a other dilemma also was represented in this textbook, you know, and um, especially when it comes to a personal, how our feelings and everything changes, our reasoning changes, like, you know, I've been driving to Dallas every day because my husband is hospitalized and um, in uh, UT Southwestern. And as I drive by and sometimes I see an accident that takes place and, you know, the person that I have never met or never seen. And I feel sad that I've seen the accident and, you know, somebody is just badly injured. But it's not the same thing like if somebody is closest to me gets injured in my family member, my feelings will be so different. And um, that's what the cognitive psychology here that it's, you know, our reasoning is different when it comes to personal and impersonal reasoning. And um, the first moral problem is called the impersonal reasoning because it relies on the calculation that can be applied to any topic and does not involve the reasoner. The second problem that is represented here is suppose that in the trolley dilemma, you are sitting on the footbridge over the trolley tra tracks and a large stranger is sitting nearby. If you were to push him onto the tracks, 
his body would stop the trolley and save the five people would you push him onto the tracks the first one just gives you the example and say what would you decide the second one is actually putting ourselves in the place and they ask the question will you do it and you know and uh, there is a study is done and research done there are some college students how they respond to these two different dilemmas when it's not involved them personally and when it's involves them personally have to take an action and uh, our brain works in a very different way in two different places and it's very interesting and it makes a lot of sense when we are understanding why we do what we do you know why other people do the way they do and um, this chapter is very very fascinating for me because uh, i work with the foster care home children and i am i'm very interested in the behaviors why people do what they do and um, this chapter is really opened my eyes to see how our brain works with the simple reasoning you know and um, it's it's really eye opening and uh, please take time to read this chapter and try to understand with you know it's um, it's very very fascinating and here is that brain part where it works like these two parts is like you know where the impersonal reasoning affects and the personal reasoning affects in a two different place and here is the detail of it that is given and um, the more we study about brain it's a very complex organ and um, the more we have to learn and it's um, it is it is definitely a very fascinating subject for me personally and the third second one that affects the ill defined problem is um, the influence of culture the solution to these ill defined dilemmas require judgments that combine moral emotional and cultural components of it again the book represents two different um, examples and it's represented to the people who are here in america and as well as how would the different country would answer that same question and same dilemma it's everything has to related with our cultural components our cultural upbringing and um, it was it is uh, the the story is about your ship as sunk at sea you are in the ocean with your mother your spouse and your child because of your poor swimming ability and the absence of any flotation device you can only save on one other person from drowning who would you save and why you know and um, the, the the it's it's very interesting the answers are you know it's yeah. and the reasons why they chose those answers also is very very interesting and please do take time to read that um example and uh, try to understand how we all are influenced by the cultural upbringing and the decisions the judgments that we make day to day our life is very very important and able to understand so that we have a better understanding of the people come from a different culture especially in america you see so many different walks of life people live here and they do things and you may not understand why they do it you know and if you if you understand this example and it gives why people do what they do and makes it more interesting for me and the third one is a cognitive skill and well defined and ill defined problem solving and uh, well defined and ill defined problems requires different types of cognitive skills and ability to uh, to reason an ability to reason and draw inference an ability to monitor whether the reasoning is progressing correctly whether it's a well defined problem or a ill defined problem you need to have these requirement you know every time we solve a problem you know how do we come to ability to for reason and why did we come to the conclusion where we come and the next one is the ability to monitor whether the reasoning is progressing correctly because you don't want to get stuck in the problem but you want to progress you want to move on you want to reach that uh, 
achievement, the goal to complete in um, ill-defined problem. There is a third, the, these, these type of things are called um, metacognition, but it is a cr critical aspect of all reasoning and problem solving. And um, there is a third, third skill that is required in a ill-defined problem is um, epistemic monitoring. This skill reflects the problem solver's ability to tell whether they are creating a legitimate representation and whether they are using the correct understanding and appropriate method to solve the problem. And um, this is very important. This is um, the third point that we need in a well-defined problem to say, you know, the whether we are we are choosing do we understand the pro problem correctly and you know, how to solve this complicated ill-defined problem in our life and things like that the final one in this first session is um, framing a problem the roles of values a special characteristics of both well-defined and ill-defined problem is that the solver's approach to the problem is influenced by how the problem is contextualized or framed, how is been problem put before us. And there is an example, and I'm sure you all been to supermarkets, you all been bought something and just looking at the labels after reading this chapter, I am sure you will pay more attention to what the label says. And one of the example our textbook says, there is two types of meats, meat A and meat B. Uh, in a meat A is a 75% lean. The meat B is a 25% fat. It is just simply how they worded the sentence, but both of them are the same meat, 75% lean and 25% fat. It's both the meats are the same, but it's how they labeled it according to based on that, how people react to it and how people differentiate it. And that's what the framing of problem is all about it, all, all about. So when you, when you go next time to the supermarket, pay attention to the labels, what it says and how it is. And I hope, I hope this lecture has just helped you a little bit of a curiosity in you to learn more about um, solving problems based on cognitive psychology. And um, thank you for listening. And I hope it, this helps. Thank you.